Hi, everyone. My name is Payam Siadatpour of Evershed Sutherland. We appreciate you joining us for our panel, Trends in M&A and Other Strategic Transactions in the BDC Space. I'm joined today by my partner, Doug Leary, who is one of our M&A experts, along with John Simpson and Todd Owens of Broadhaven Capital Partners, an independent merchant banking firm with a leading position in the financial services and asset management sector. First, I'll ask our panel members to briefly introduce themselves and give a brief overview of their experience with BDCs. So, Doug, why don't we start with you, and then we'll go to John and Todd, please. Sure, happy to do fine. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Doug Leary, a partner in the corporate group. I've been with Evershed's or its predecessor, Sutherland S. Home Brennan, for uh, 30 years. I specialize in uh, mergers and acquisition transactions, primarily in the BDC financial services space. I do a lot of transactions involving investment advisors, alternative asset managers, broker dealers, uh, insurance company, lots of insurance business, et cetera. Um, as far as BDCs go, I've been representing BDC since the early 90s. Uh, I've been involved in everything from SEC reporting to fund formation uh, to pre-IPO um, transactions to IPOs, portfolio level transactions, and then uh, at the highest level, uh, M&A strategic transactions. Um, I've been involved in many, if not most, of the uh, major BDC strategic transactions over the last 10 years or so, starting with post-financial crisis transactions and um, going all through uh, to, to the recent weeks where deals have been announced. Thanks. John? Thanks, Brian. I'm John Simpson, along with Todd Owens. I'm a partner at Broadhaven Capital Partners. Uh, I started life as a lawyer at the Cravath firm in New York, was the vice chairman of Washington Corella for a number of years, and then started in the credit business as vice chairman and chief operating officer at Canyon Partners, about a $30 billion credit hedge fund located in Los Angeles, which is tax credit Todd, and have been involved in the credit space now for almost 20 years. Um, at Broadhaven, I do a fair amount in the asset management and alternative asset management space. And Todd and I together uh, run our BDC practice where we represent a number of players in the industry. Todd? Thanks, John. Um, as John mentioned, I am a partner as well at Broadhaven Capital. I began my career uh, in the investment banking division of Goldman Sachs, where, among other things, I ran the specialty finance sector within the financial institutions group. And in that capacity, I launched Goldman's coverage of the BDC space some 15 years ago. I left Goldman after more than two decades to join Fifth Street, initially as president and then as CEO of the public BDC. And after the sale of Fifth Street to Oak Tree, I came back into banking at Broadhaven, where I've been for three years now. Like John, I advise clients in the asset management and alternative asset management space. I also spend a fair amount of time in specialty finance. Um, and uh, John and I spend uh, uh, a lot of our time as well in the BBC space. Great. Thank you guys very much. So over the past several years, we've seen a fair amount of con uh, consolidation in the BDC space. And in our discussion today, we'll touch on the general trends that we've seen in the BDC industry, how some of those trends have led to strategic transactions. And of course, we'll touch on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll also discuss the various types of transaction structures that we've seen and the related legal and business issues that drive the deal process. So with that background, Todd, I'll ask you to start us off. At a high level, what are the trends we've seen in the BDC industry over the past few years? And putting aside the impact of COVID-19 for just a minute, what are the primary drivers of strategic transactions in the industry and where has there been the most deal activity? Uh, thanks, Pai. I'm happy to, happy to take the first one. I think the operating trend pre-COVID are, are reasonably well understood. Uh, first of all, I'd say it's been an intensely competitive origination market, which has driven spreads down, eroded traditional deal protections, and increased leverage at the deal level. Leverage at the fund level has also steadily increased, and that's related in part to the legislative change allowing for that. Um, but there are other, that, that trend was in place as well um, prior to that legislation. I think the third point I'd make is there is increasing differentiation among BDCs in terms of strategic focus. It's gotten to the point where you can actually differentiate among different BDCs, and analysts and investors are doing that. 
Um, the fourth point I'd make is that BDC liability structures have improved. Lower cost, longer maturities, increased unsecured borrowings. And all of these improvements, you'll note, are strongly correlated to scale. And that's going to come into the conversation as we proceed here. We've seen a, a continued focus on growth and diversification in the industry. And we've seen some fee pressure, uh, some, some pressure on fee structures, though it, it, that has evolved more slowly than perhaps might have been predicted a few years ago. In terms of strategic activity over the last several years, volumes have been moderate and reasonably consistent, a trend that we think is likely to continue. We think that the COVID-19 dislocation will amplify some of the already existing drivers of m a volume in the coming months. So for sellers, the drivers of activity have really included pressure due to credit underperformance or other operating issues, which has created persistently low valuations for underperformers, and that's frustrating to shareholders and management teams alike. Potential sellers have also cited lack of scale as an important consideration and relatedly an inability to grow their business. For buyers, the attractiveness of permanent capital has been compelling, as well as the need to build scale in public vehicles and increase diversification of funds and investor bases. One notable trend over the last decade is a dramatic increase in the valuations for uh, external managers. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit more length as we proceed here. We think those valuations have, have nearly doubled uh, over the last decade or so. So just to summarize, a highly competitive operating environment and continued strategic activity in the space, both we think are going to be amplified by the, uh, the COVID-19 dislocation. Sure. And, and picking up on that, John, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the BDC industry generally and BDC strategic transactions specifically? Uh, thanks, Brian, and thank you, Todd. Um, it's good to be with all of you, and thanks for having us. I, I think there are three or four answers to that question. I think you have to look at it as a short-term answer, a long-term answer, and it's a little bit hard to separate the impact of COVID-19 from some overall strategic trends in the industry that Todd was talking about. As you would expect in March when COVID hit, uh, you know, if a rising tide floats all boats, the tide going out certainly sinks them, and BDCs were no exception. So you saw a very stark write down in NAV and share price at a lot of BDCs. Some traded down to literally in the teens for uh, for net asset value. Um, that initial impact has been ameliorated uh, to some degree by an overall market recovery. But I think it's our belief that two things have happened. One, a BDC at the end of the day is really priced based on the quality of the assets it is perceived to own, or put a different way, the perceived quality of the asset is owned. And so you have a situation where, to the extent that people have well-diversified portfolios in sectors of the economy that recover from COVID rapidly and robustly, we think over time that will be reflected in NAP of BDC pricing. To the extent that you have concentration, small size, and credit exposure to sectors of the economy that may take a very long time to recover from COVID, if ever, that trend will play out. And the overall market recovery that has lifted all ships, as it were, we think will over time distinguish between the BDCs where the underlying credits are strong and the BDCs where the underlying credits may be either more concentrated or less strong. The second thing we think is that this is really the classic example and will probably accelerate the trend of the rich get richer, the poor do not, in that the lar it becomes increasingly, look, you can't raise capital, right, if you're trading below NAV. As a practical matter, there are ways to do it, but it's hard. And so for a smaller BDC, particularly with exposure to a COVID-sensitive or longer COVID recovery, a recovery of their own price becomes increasingly difficult. And indeed, we think there will be some cases where it becomes, almost, there are certain BDCs who just, we don't think will come back. And as a result, uh, that has to exacerbate the need to do something strategic. Uh, now, there's the limp along philosophy where you can, you know, it's permanent capital, you continue to limp along. But boards get pressures, special committees get pressures, shareholders get increasingly frustrated. and 
if you're somebody whose BDC was trading at 60 and now it's, you know, you weren't happy. If you're somebody where it's gone from 60 to 20, you're particularly unhappy. And we think there will be real pressure to see consolidation of those folks by either strategic buyers who have lots of synergies that can absorb the assets. There may be a pressure, Doug will hate this phrase, but there may be a pressure to sell management contracts, and he'll talk about that in a minute, I know. But we do think that a smaller to middle-sized BDC, particularly with a COVID-sensitive portfolio, is going to face increasing pressure to do something, and something can be defined um, as a lot of different things. And maybe that's a good segue to Doug's topic. Sure, thank you, John. Um, Doug, turning to you, can you describe the various types of uh, transaction structures that we've seen in the BDC space and how those structures have um, evolved in recent years? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think that the thing that makes the BDC space unique is that there are really multiple constituencies. There, there's you know, the BDC itself and its, its shareholders. Uh, there's also the external advisor in most cases, unless they're internally managed, um, and the owners of the manager. Um, so we've seen this evolution where, um, you know, somebody might be more interested in the advisory contract, but or somebody else might be more interested in the BDC. And I think over time, what we've seen is more hybrid transactions. Um, there's also a, a third category of things down at the portfolio level. Um, KCAP recently sold its uh, CLO management um, operations um, prior to the externalization. And so th these transactions can take many forms, and it really depends on you know, what the main focus of, of the, the deal is. Um, again, you can acquire the BDC. Um, through a merger transaction um, that raises many of the, the same public company deals that you'd see, you know, in any publicly traded uh, company transaction. Um, you can acquire, acquire the assets of the BDC, some or all of them. Um, asset transactions and public companies tend to uh, be difficult uh, in, in some cases just because of um, you know, what's left over and, and uh, the idea behind an asset sale, uh, but it can be done. Um, we see traditional merger structures. Um, in the BDC space in particular, we're seeing a lot of uh, what I call the double merger structure, um, where it's a um, reverse triangular merger followed by an immediate merger of uh, the target BDC into the, the acquiring BDC. Um, there are tax and, and um, other uh, reasons why those are structured that way. Uh, but that's become pretty standard in the BDC industry. Um, it, it can also be an equity injection into the BDC. It can be um, an acquisition of the contract, uh, or it can be a hybrid, again, you know, an equity injection coupled with uh, taking over management of the company. Um, so we've, we've seen a lot of different things over the, the past few years. The first couple of transactions were uh, in 2010 were kind of merger transactions um you know one was a double merger one was a forward merger and um, then we saw an equity injection coupled with the transfer of the contract um but over the years we've we've seen a number of um combined structures you know the triangle transaction was a, a sale of its investment portfolio coupled with the simultaneous externalization uh, of the management function to bearings um and that was a unique transaction. It was uh, difficult to, to execute, uh, but it all came through. And at the end of the day, the triangle shareholders, um, you know, came out better than NAV, which is um, generally the, the the goal that, that um, you know, people have or, or focus on is how close to NAV is this transaction taking place. Um, again, sale of assets is not that, that common. Um, but it can be done, a, a merger transaction is usually the, the main focus. Um, if it's an acquisition of the advisor, one thing that we've seen over the years is uh, that a straight acquisition of the advisor without any incentive for the BDC uh, can be a little bit difficult to execute. And, and I think the 
the, the thinking on that has evolved that you know, ultimately the shareholders of the BDC uh, get to decide you know, who's going to be the advisor. Uh, and the board of directors gets to decide who, who's going to be the advisor. So uh, there's nothing wrong with the external advisor you know, getting compensated for the, the business that it's built. But at the same time, um, a little bit of the love is, is now shared with the, the BDC and or its uh, shareholders. Um, uh, and I think the, the last category that I would just throw out there is, um, you know, mixing and matching the different types of structures, but, but also uh, affiliate transactions. And special rules apply in connection with affiliate transactions, both under the Investment Company Act and then uh, state law fiduciary duties. Uh, there, there are, you know, I, I think, more acute implications of fiduciary duty and affiliate transactions. Sure, and, and all those uh, structures that Doug, you laid out, obviously have their own unique uh, considerations, uh, whether it's like you've mentioned affiliated transactions, we need to get SEC exemptive relief uh, to be able to complete a transaction, uh, obviously shareholder approval, all things that would need to be considered uh, when deciding which particular type of transaction and how to, how to structure the transaction. And I guess um, clearly an important component of any deal uh, would be valuation. Um, in particular, Todd, uh, with respect to valuation of management contracts. Can you discuss how uh, the valuation of management contracts have evolved and uh, where they stand today? Of course, happy to do that. Look, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a notable increase in valuations for uh, external advisors who manage these uh, external contracts over the last decade or so. And that's really driven by the buyers placing a higher value on permanent public capital and importantly, becoming more comfortable with the longevity of these contracts. And it's that point, the comfort that the management contracts are unlikely to be lost, that's critical to the deal volumes over the last several years. Because we've seen a lot of interest, a lot of buyer interest from outside the industry. Um, and, and we really believe that, that that interest from outside the industry is, is a key driver of valuations in the space. And as a result of that, we see valuations for uh, management contracts consistently in the five to six times fee revenue range. And that's approximately a mid-teens percentage of NAV. The buyer universe has been deep enough to support those valuations over the last several years, and there's often multiple bidders uh, for the uh, external advisor. And, and notwithstanding the meaningful increase in the valuations over the last decade or so, valuations over the last several years seem to have really stabilized at the levels I just described. Buyer interest has been mostly from strategic acquirers who don't have a BDC or don't have a public BDC uh, or have a BDC that is sub-stale relative to the market and their other businesses. And so with some exception, um, the deals and discussions that we've seen are smaller or mid-sized BDCs selling to strategic buyers looking to enter the market or gain scale in the BDC space. I think it's notable that, that the largest players in the space have not been most, among the most aggressive bidders for these small and medium-sized BDCs. So again, on valuation, we've seen a reasonably deep buyer market at about five to six times fee revenue and mid teens percentage of, of NAV. Great. Thanks, Todd. So, uh, Doug, can you walk us through some of the board level issues that arise throughout the course of a BDC strategic transaction and how you guide boards through those issues? And obviously, they're going to be a little bit different depending on the type of the transaction, but just in general, to lay out some of the issues for us and, and how we would advise boards uh, to deal with those issues. Yeah, um, you know, first of all, you, you need to get a quick understanding of, you know, what the, the focus of the transaction is, what the ultimate goal is, you know, who the players are. Um, you know, for a BDC to simply uh, approve a new manager, um, there's one set of fiduciary duties that apply. Uh, and under state law, I would say it's business judgment rule. Uh, subject to the overlay of the Investment Company Act, um, where they have to follow the 15C process um, and, and make sure that, you know, they're choosing an appropriate advisor. Um, but if the transaction also involves, you know, true change of control for state law purposes, um, then the, the Board of Directors has heightened duties, uh, the so-called Revlon duties um, under Delaware law. And, you know, most, most states... 
uh, follow that, or you know, we always take the take the view that it's safer to assume that Revlon duties apply. Um, and so that's going to guide the, the board as far as um, you know the, what what their responsibilities are um, and how the transaction is going to play out. Um, at the board level of the BDC, um, if it's an advisor sale, um, there's likely a conflict of interest um, because you know, the uh, the advisor is owned by uh, personnel who are likely on the board of directors of the BDC, um, and in that case, you've already got you know independent directors, um, but it may not be a bad idea to to section off into a into a special committee. Um, if it's a true BDC transaction, uh, a merger with a third party, um, you might not need a special committee um, unless there are conflicts of interest um, that are presented. Um, again, if the board, a majority of the board is independent and disinterested in a transaction, um, you know, pretty good position that you don't need a special committee. Um, but if management uh, directors, you know, on the on the board, are going to go along with the transaction, or they're they're going to be employed, or they're going to get some sort of buyout. Um, you know, then you you look at it more closely and and may want to fall off into a special committee. Um, from a fiduciary duty perspective, um, you know, the duty of care, duty of loyalty. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the, the Revlon duties and any overlay of the uh, Investment Company Act. Um, you know, as a preliminary matter, just, you know, making sure everybody understands the goal of the transaction. Uh, one interesting thing that we've seen is where a BDC decides that it is going to explore uh, strategic transactions and expressly says that the, you know, the goal of the transaction is to get scale or uh, something else. Bids will come in for part of the BDC, all of the BDC for the manager, for both the manager and part of the BDC. Um, and you know, each of those those bids raise different issues and different questions. And so, um, you know, the first first part of the process is, uh, you know, making sure that the board is appropriately advised that they are aware of their opportunities. They're they're aware of the. Uh, pros and cons of the different uh, uh, potential strategic transactions. Um, you know, it, it, in the, the first part of the process, uh, most BDCs are very good with this, um, retaining an investment banker, um, interviewing not just one firm, but maybe two or three uh, people who know the space, understanding what conflicts of interest there might be, understanding what the fees would be. Um, and then you get into the, the actual process, um, you know, the, the NDA process. Um, it seems pretty straightforward, but there are fiduciary duty implications of the, the uh, NDA process and mostly related to standstill arrangements. Um, you know, under Delaware law, there's been some noise about standstills and whether they should remain in effect after a transaction has been announced. Um, so I usually focus very closely on the NDA, the form of the NDA, making sure that the board understands what's in the NDA and, um, you know, understands uh, how it works when they, they ultimately announce a deal and what their uh, ability to talk with other people will be. Um, and then, of course, that, that gets tied into negotiation of the actual uh, merger agreement and the fiduciary uh, duties that were implicated um, you know, whether or not Revlon applies is subject to a lot of uh, case law and uh, law review articles, and I, I won't bore, bore people, but that's something that needs to be focused on uh, closely. Um, related issues in the agreement are the fiduciary out, the ability of the board of directors to talk to a third party once they've signed a merger agreement about a potentially topping bid, um, the circumstances in which they can change their recommendation to the shareholders, um, and then there are related issues that, that you have to grapple with as far as if there's an affiliate transaction, um, do you want to get approval of the majority of the minority shareholders? Um, you know, what the termination fees might be, um, if there's an N below NAB issuance, you know, the acquirer is going to issue below NAB, 
Um, that's going to raise additional approval requirements by the acquirer. Um, and then, you know, you get into unique affiliate issues, the 17A8 um, non-dilution issues, um, termination fees, and whether it's appropriate in an affiliate transaction um, and, and related issues. So again, it's, it's uh, all the public company issues that you'd ordinarily uh, address you know, all the state law fiduciary duties you would ordinarily address. Um, and then, you know, special overlay of Investment Company Act issues um, and, you know, how to make sure that the transaction is structured properly to comply. So thanks, Doug. Let me just ask you well, one follow-up question. You mentioned special committees, which obviously if there is a uh, affiliated transaction or some kind of a uh, obvious conflict, you would want to have a, a special committee. Um, if there's not an obvious conflict, is there any downside to having a special committee notwithstanding, uh, you know, the, the lack of conflict? Or it, would there be, if there's no conflict, if you form a special committee, is there any issue doing so? Any pros and cons there? There are differences of opinion on that. Um, you'll see some people take the position that you should not appoint a special committee because it's a de facto acknowledgement that there's a conflict of interest. Um, and then suddenly you're subject to, you know, a higher standard of, of review and analysis. Um, you know, some conflicts of interest uh, are, you know, uh, a member of management will get a bonus if it's internally managed. A, a member of management will get a bonus if the transaction happens. You know, that's a conflict of interest because they may push to get a deal done because they get a big bonus. Um, but it's something that people know about. It's something that the board approved. Um, it's something that uh, the board can take into account um, as they're evaluating the transaction. Um, but then there, there are other you know, true conflicts um, where the advisors is being sold and, and you know, management directors stand to profit. Um, that you, you know, you, you want to make sure that it's a process that is clear that it hasn't been tainted. Um, but again, the difference of opinion is the way you automatically go to special committee. Um, in a lot of cases, there's no reason why the independent directors can't can't approve the transaction. Right. So, all the factors, Doug, that you laid out, uh, will obviously need to be described in great detail in the merger proxy, assuming that uh, a shareholder approval is required, which almost always would be the case. In those proxies in particular, in the background section, where we basically lay out the narrative of the process, which is a word you used a lot in going through uh, the board considerations, um, all those things are laid out in great detail. Uh, the negotiations that the parties undertook, any conflicts and how they were mitigated, a description of any fairness opinion uh, that's issued, and, and basically all the factors that the board uh, considered before recommending the transaction um, to their respective shareholders. And ultimately, the, the process that you described and how it's described in the proxy is obviously going to be a key line of defense to any shareholder action challenging the transaction, which uh, feels almost inevitable, you know, that with any transaction, there will be some kind of challenge. So with all that, uh, John, Many significant BDC transactions have involved the receipt of a fairness opinion by the boards or uh, the, the special committees that uh, Doug alluded to. Can you walk us through the fairness opinion process and discuss the relative weight of the various factors considered when delivering a fairness opinion? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Let's start with what a fairness opinion is and isn't, because there's sometimes misapprehension about that. A good fairness opinion never saves a bad process. And, and there's a bunch of Delaware case law relevant to this that's quite recent. Essentially, a fairness opinion in its purest form is an opinion of the investment bank as to the valuation of the consideration being either received or paid, depending on who the client is. So if, for example, we're representing a BDC and it is merging with another BDC in a stock merger, we would, have, well, take the simplest. Let's assume we're representing a BDC that's simply being sold for cash. What we're doing there is we're opining to our client, which is typically the board or the special committee, that the amount paid is fair from a financial point of view to the shareholders of the BDC who are selling. And so if the BDC is receiving $25 a share, we're opining that $25 a share is 
what does fair mean? Well, that's a subject of debate for hundreds of years. Essentially, it doesn't mean it's the highest price. It doesn't mean it's the best price you could have gotten. What it means is that using a whole variety of financial metrics, comparable transactions, comparable trading multiples, discounted cash flow analysis, a look at multiples of a variety of indicia, revenues, some proxy for EBITDA, management fees, all those kinds of things, that it's in what I would characterize as the range of reason. If we're representing a merger partner, so let's say BDCA is merging with BDCP, what we would be doing is opining that the still that the consideration to be received by our clients, BDCA, is fair from a financial point of view, but there we would have to value not only our client, but the party with which they're merging. So if we represent A, and they're taking B stock, and B stock, let's just assume, trades at $25 a share, so it's a one-to-one -one exchange ratio, we would have to ask ourselves the question of whether the $25 a share stock at which BDCB trades is a reasonable and fair reflection of the value of that business. Now, the, the starting point for all of this uh, on a BDC to BDC merger is generally NAB. So if you were to simply say, what is a BDC? What, what's the right exchange rate for, for a BDC merger? You'd say very simplistically, well, it's NAB to NAB. Because after all, that's the compilation of the assets. So the third party has come up with the NAV, and that therefore is almost by definition a fair exchange ratio. And the answer is maybe. Uh, it's not a bad place to start, but there may be real reasons having to do with trading characteristics, relative size, liquidity in the marketplace, that one man's NAV is not another man's NAV. So it may well be that you come to the conclusion that some disparity in NAV is appropriate, either, either high or low, because of a variety of factors. If you're selling the management contract, and I know that's a phrase people don't like, then it's a much more classic valuation exercise, right? What's the contract for? And there are revenue multiples out there that will answer that question. The important thing to keep in mind, however, is that, and this is very important, BDCs, I don't know about uniquely, but certainly as Doug was saying, more typically than the average transaction are rife with conflict. So if, if the BDC board comes to us and says, well, we're still a management contract and we're gonna get a hundred million dollars for it, the manager may well say, well, that's my contract. Thank you very much. I'll take the hundred million. And the BDC board may say, well, wait a minute. We have to consent to that and we have to consent to the change of manager and we'd like to capture some of that value for ourselves. And that's that's a negotiation. There's no moral on it. Some people may feel there is, but I don't know that there's a moral answer to that question. I think what it is is a simple negotiation between that board and the manager as to whether and if there's any kind of relative split of the consideration. We can tell the board whether the price for which the management contract is being sold is fair. Is it worth $100 million? Should they get more? Are they getting too much? Uh, but we can't tell them whether they should get a penny, a dollar, $10, or $50 million of those proceeds. So the banker really has two or three roles. It's to render a fairness is to give and strategic advice as to what to do. And then incredibly important along with lawyers to make sure that the process is run in a way that leads to a result that is considered to be a reasonable and fair result. And Doug can talk about this far better than I, but our experience has been that particularly in Delaware, the courts don't like to second guess price because they don't think they're good at it. The chancellor sits there. I don't know how to figure out if the better is the right price, or should it be twenty, or should it be twenty-eight? Right? That's what the bank is designed to do. And I'm willing to accept that the banker, if unconflicted and picked appropriately, made its best judgment. Might have made a mistake, but made its best judgment. But what I really know how to do is figure out process, and I really know how to figure out whether the banker was conflicted, whether the directors were conflicted, whether the manager ran roughshod over the special committee, that I know how to do. And so getting back to a good fairness opinion never saved the bad process. So 
uh, Doug was kind enough to say the most important and first thing that a board should do is pick their banker, and I would never disagree, but <laughs> it is extraordinarily important in these kind of processes because they are so ripe with conflict to pick an experienced, thoughtful counsel who's been around corporate space, the BDC space, the credit space, the asset management space, we have one in mind. But my point is you can't be too careful in these situations. And a fairness opinion is fundamentally a financial analytical tool. It doesn't speak to process. And while in a normal sale process, Acme widget is selling the beta widget, completely unrelated, getting $100 a share, the court's gonna look and say, you know, the banker's opinion is reasonable. It seems to have been fair, compared on a fair basis. They seem to have done a bunch of work. They seem to have gone through the right kind of steps that we see bankers do. That's oftentimes the end of the story. In a BDC process with conflicts, that's the beginning of the story. And the opinion can be well-prepared and based on reasonable factors and based on a lot of work as is typically done. But if the process is flawed, good opinion never saved that process. So we tend to think the opinion's important. The other thing we will say is we periodically get calls which say, great news, you're retained, we need a fairness opinion, today's Friday, how's Sunday? And, I, and my usual answer is, of which we But if th there, have, there are big public company deals that are done over a weekend, happens all the time. Um, massive amount of public information, companies have been following each other forever. Those processes you can do over a several day period. In a BDC process, you virtually can. Uh, and so a simple indicia, judges will sit there and say, it's all wonderful that you did this big thick book and a bunch of work. You did it over two days, it can't have been reasonably prepared. And then the final question you have to ask yourself is, do you, don't you go in and try to actually figure out if the loan pricing is correct. <clears throat> we don't, because it's our business isn't to go in at the individual loan level and disagree with whether the likelihood of repayment or whether the rate's appropriate or whatever it is. So the other thing important in getting a fairness opinion is understand that the pricing policy within the BDC is extraordinarily important because we're going to essentially assume that the book's been marked fairly. Now, if we see something that's way out of whack, right? The thing's been in default for six months and it's marked at par. We're sure going to ask why. Um, but as a general rule, a fairness opinion isn't going to opine as to the actual value of the underlying credits into a pricing mechanism that ensures those valuations are appropriate. Doesn't mean they have to be exact, but it means they have to be appropriate, consistently prepared in good faith is very important. So that's a long-winded way of saying fairness opinion is very important, more important in this context. Good opinion never saved a bad process. And the, the opinion is what it is, but there's lots of things in a BDC process which don't normally present in a typical corporate transaction, which make the fairness opinion important, but not the only important factor. Th thanks, John. And you, know, you use the word process quite a bit, and you know, it can be painful to go through, but um, the reality is that it really can be the difference between the deal succeeding and not. And, and frankly, even when you do have a, a good, robust process, um, if there's a perception that the process wasn't robust, that can get you in trouble as well. So that, that's, that's very helpful. Um, Todd, uh, going over to you, do you expect significant M&A activity over the balance of this year, or has the pandemic resulted in a wait-and-see approach? And, and a related question, what are the likely drivers of M&A activity? Do you think BDC is coming under pressure from lenders will drive strategic transactions as we saw in several instances uh, during the financial crisis or are things different in this environment? Yeah, Pine, look, we, we expect uh, continued moderate to high level of strategic activity in the space consistent with the past several years uh, over the next several years. And what that means to us is kind of three to five deals a year for the next several years. Um, will we see more deals happen in the current year? 
it's hard to say, uh, given the pandemic. I, I do think that the COVID-19 pandemic is, it has already had and will continue to have a lot of implications for the industry. Um, you know, first and fundamentally, and we touched on this a little bit at the outset, uh, it's had a significant impact on the on the businesses, the underlying businesses. We've seen mark to market volatility, um, which uh, which is separate and distinct from the second thing we've seen, which is real credit losses in the portfolio, which really started to show in the June quarter. And we expect that we will see continued credit issues in the coming quarters as the pandemic ripples through the economy and potentially as the government support. Uh, in this in this time phases out or is reduced. And so the 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 pandemic itself has hit the public valuations pretty hard and 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 led, for example, to several equity raises that have been done below NAV to bolster balance sheets. So as a result of, of the pandemic, we do think that BDC managers have put strategic considerations on the back burner uh, over the last six months or so. Having said that, I think the, the stress of the COVID-19 market is going to amplify many of the drivers of consolidation in the space, which is why we expect continued M&A volumes over the next several years. And the drivers of that volume are going to look familiar um, to, uh, to what we've seen in the past, and I think will be amplified or exacerbated, if you will, by the COVID dislocation. We think fundamentally that credit pressures will drive low public market valuations, particularly for underperformers, and will increase pressure from lenders, particularly on the warehouse side. And I think the lack of scale will continue to be a serious competitive disadvantage for small players. Um, and so although we do believe that M&A volumes will be supported by COVID-19, we don't really anticipate truly kind of panic sellers. The BDC industry is an interesting uh, industry in that leverage levels are are not a, as much a force and function in the BDC space as they are in other parts of financial services. And leverage levels are higher than they higher now than they've been uh, uh, recently, um, but we're still kind of right around one to one or even a little bit better than that in the industry. And we expect lenders, warehouse lenders, to be constructive where they possibly can be. And so we don't we don't see a lot of kind of crisis sellers or forced sellers, but we do see the pressure increasing and, and supporting the kinds of deal volumes that we just uh, that we just described three to five per year. Will we see some more this year? Maybe, uh, but certainly by the early part of next year, I think we will be you know barring any other dislocation in the market, we'll start to see a pickup again in deal. Okay, thanks very much for that. So. We're getting pretty close to our, uh, our time limit here. I guess the final question for each of you, um, can you each give us some final words of advice on what you view as the most important things that managers should be mindful of before pursuing a strategic transaction? Doug, why don't we start with you? And uh, yeah. um, I guess I, I would, would focus on, as John mentioned, process um, in, in public company deals in particular, where there's a lot of attention. There are, are plaintiff's lawyers uh, scouring the proxy, um, taking the time to set up a process that's both uh, logical, uh, measured, and robust. Um, everybody's going to be better off. Um, doing things like keeping copious notes regarding uh, you know, when the board met, when the special committee, uh, committee met, when things were approved, um, who the bidders are, what the revised bids were. Those things get disclosed in excruciating detail these days uh, in the proxy statement. Um, and, and that's a result of both securities laws concerned and then state law um, uh, approval requirements to make sure that it's an informed vote. Um, and so the, the issue becomes uh, making sure that you have uh, the ability to document the process because people will be all over that process and try to poke holes into it. Um, uh, and as, as Broadhaven knows, you know, people will try to poke holes in uh, the, the fairness opinion process and um, you know, valuation process and, and everything else. So again, kind of play defense from the get-go, particularly on the sell side. Um, getting counsel involved early, 
um, kind of mapping out the strategy and, and having a plan uh, for contingency because there will be unexpected developments. Um, and I think having uh, a, a plan, you know, for that is is always going to be in the uh, big best interest. Thanks, Doug. So process and documenting the process, which which I know all of our clients love to watch lawyers go through, makes us very popular with them. But I think uh, obviously, uh, it, it unfortunately, is necessary and very important. John, um, uh, any final words of advice? No, look, I mean, my, I remember college economics. The one thing I do remember is John Maynard Keynes' famous statement that the market can stay rational longer than you can stay calling. And I think BBC boards, particularly smaller BBC boards, need to take a really hard look at their strategic situation. Um, it is very difficult, in our judgment, for a smaller BBC, which is not in a, and there are some great small BBCs, but a smaller BBC, which is not in a clearly identifiable niche without real expertise where NAV, or the price to NAV has been damaged pretty significantly. I think you really have to ask yourself the question of the likelihood of that comes back. And, and I, I don't prejudge that answer, but there, you know, the old phrase, what goes up must come down. It is not true that what goes down must come up. Now, that doesn't mean that you simply go sell for cash and you're done, right? You have the opportunity to do that if that's what you choose. You could try to choose a manager that you think somehow enhances your prospects, so that's very hard. Um, you could do a stock deal where you get the benefit of a combined business going forward and potentially a premium to your current uh, price demand, and that could be attractive. Or you could really conclude that your prospects as an independent business are the best thing for your shareholders. And that's going to depend on market conditions, your options, available prospects, and all that. But fundamentally, if, if we're advising a board, what we say to them is, well, pick your time frame, right? It doesn't have to be six weeks but it's probably not 20 years. And over some reasonable period of time, whatever you think that is, but it's probably a single digit number of years and it's probably lower rather than higher, what is going to deliver the best value to your shareholders? And if it's simply staying the course, that's great, but you need to have a fundamental analytically based conclusion that that really is the right thing to do. And we think in some cases, that may be a challenging conclusion to reach. But every time you do a 15C, you're certainly reaffirming the manager, and that's a good thing. But at least we tell people to at least ask themselves the question, is this strategically is the right thing to do? Well, let's assume this manager is terrific. Strategically is the right thing to do, continue on this path under these market conditions, knowing our available options. And we just think that's important. I don't think you have to do it daily, but once a year or so probably isn't a bad idea. Todd? Yeah, Pam, I, I just briefly, I think we're out of time here, but I'd, I'd, I'd make a few points. Number one, there's going to be an opportunity to participate in strategic activity. If you're a seller, there's a deep uh, buyer universe. And if you're a buyer, we do think that there are going to be sellers that are going to be throwing in the towel for all the reasons that we've thought about. And so this is going to be a, 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 a thing that you can participate in going forward over the last three years. I think the second point, and we really haven't touched on it too much this call, is and this may be self-evident, but I just think it bears mentioning. The BDC business is a lending business, and credit is central to all of these decisions. It can create lots of issues. Um, it can create volatility. It can put stress on process. And, and so a starting point for anybody thinking about strategic activity in the space, you really have to go back to basis and think about credit and, and make sure that that's buttoned up and, and you're thoughtful about that. And then the third point I'm just going to touch on, even though I think we was perhaps using a dead horse, is process really matters. There's a, there's a lot of moving pieces in a BBC transaction and, uh, and your protection uh, against um, litigation and other risks is 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 made better by a good process, but also a good process is just going to arrive thinking about it aggressive or, or proactively. A good process is going to arrive at the best answer for your shareholders, and so that is the third point I'd make. That's the part about process. And Pyam, to your earlier right. well, process is yep. tough. I'm sorry. To your earlier point, process is tough and sometimes unpleasant. But it's a heck of a lot more pleasant than a plaintiff's lawsuit or a regulatory investigation. 
No, uh, uh, no argument here. Uh, that's exactly right. So um, I think we are probably out of time, as evidenced by the fact that the auto light in my office has shut off. Um, but um, on that note, we want to thank all of you for watching our panel. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact any of us. Uh, you should see our contact information on your screens. I want to thank Doug, John, and Todd for doing all the hard work on this panel, walking us through these interesting issues. On behalf of all of us, we hope that we can see you all in person at our 2021 BDC Roundtable. Until then, stay safe, everyone. Thanks again for watching. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.